and finally look to Lord Michael Heseltine, ex-president, Pembroke College, to close the case for the opposition. <laughs> Mr. President, um, I understand Michael's sense of frustration. I've sat in a cabinet with him, I've held ministerial portfolios, and uh, there have been times when European directives or the European courts have done something which annoyed me. What you, Mr. President, have to decide today is whether examples of that sort, infuriating as they are, weigh in the scales of history against the enormity of the role of Britain in tomorrow's world and the context in which that role will unfold. Now there have been such a wide range of points that in the brief moments that are available to me I will try to skate over them as fast as is practical. And the first has to be economics. The fact of the matter is 47% of our trade goes to the European market. And if we were to pull out, there were many arguments that are advanced. First of all, we would save a great deal of money. There's a bus going round the place actually saying how much money would be available for the health service. There are many versions of that story. But the real world is there will be no savings because in order to make sure that 47% of our trade, nearly one pound in every two of our trade, goes into that enormous market on our doorstep, we will have to conclude a negotiation with the Europeans. And there are only four countries that have done that and stayed outside. We've heard of Norway and Switzerland, which are the principally larger ones. They all pay to remain trading within the marketplace. And they have to accept the free movement of people within their countries. And they are not members of any of the deliberating bodies that determine the rules of Europe. So there's no gain, but there's a lot of loss. And you heard much about sovereignty tonight. You can't imagine in economic terms a greater abdication of sovereignty than to accept to one in two of every exporter in this country that you will do as you are told, you will get a fax telling you of every change made in the European Union and you will comply with it and there'll be no Brit anywhere near any conference table that led to those changes. That is the abdication of sovereignty on a massive and irresponsible scale, which is what the Brexit scale is all about. And in order, in order to enlighten you, they say, well, don't worry, don't worry. There's only a handful of British companies exporting to Europe. I think the figure they use is about a thousand. And they mention, yes, they do concede some of the big ones. Of course, they start then talking about the giant companies as though they are the ones that matter. They talk about Rolls-Royce and the uh, Jaguar they talk about. Um, they talk about the wings of the Airbus. And so you can sit back and relax and say, well, you're know, very big stuff. They're not nothing to do with me. Every one of those companies has got thousands of subcontractors manufacturing the components that go into the Jaguar or into the Rolls-Royce engines. And every one of those small and medium-sized companies is an exporter into the European Union. And all the service industries that stand behind those manufacturing companies, all of them depend on the trade with the European Union. So the idea that it's some great racket of giant companies is preposterous. But they don't mind trying to deceive you into believing it's just a handful of companies. So, of course. Um, I just find it very difficult to understand why 500 million in a world population of 7.3 billion is that important. Because 47% of our trade goes there. That's why it's so important.
<laughs> There's been a point of order. Please rise and state your point. Could the president please ask individuals with no uh, moral consent to further pursue a point of information to please restrain a point of information and avoid interrupting the speaker who's giving an important speech today? Thank you very much. Sorry, Jeffrey. I'm just to this point. Ma forgive me, I have four more minutes for the fate of Europe, please. <laughs> and, and, so, and so the argument goes, we turn our back on the 47% of our trade, but don't worry, there's a great market out there. There's Brexit and there's India and there's South America and goodness knows where there isn't. We've discovered the hallelujah of a new world. Slight problem. The French, the Germans, the Italians, they're not bog stupid, you know. They're already there, outselling us with the very products we can't compete with in Europe because of the standards of Europe, which we are not as good at achieving as all those European companies that are beating us in the other markets of the world. So you can't run away from your giant home market. It's a delusion. The second point I want to say a word about, which of course, the bleeding stump of sovereignty, the imposition of this monstrous bureaucracy about which we've heard so much. There is no alternative model. You will do what you are told. Brussels, they will lay down the balls. Excuse me. We're not members of Schengen. We're not members of the Europe. Euro, John Major got concessions of exemption at Maastricht. Margaret Thatcher got a rebate when she negotiated the terms of our member. And David Cameron actually overturned the budget of the European Commission when he didn't like the look of it because he went round the capitals of Europe to the elected members of the membership of Europe and he got them to turn over the bureaucrats' budgets in Brussels. So who was in charge? When David Cameron the other day set out, Michael didn't make the conclusions, he may be right about that, but when David Cameron went out to renegotiate Britain's New Deal in Europe, where did he go? Where did he go? You all know where we went. To 27 other capitals of Europe, where the elected members of the governments of Europe are to be found where they sit on the Council of Ministers, which tells the bureaucrats in Brussels what they can and cannot do. It is like saying of a government, and my God, haven't we all done it? It's all the civil servants, you know. It's all Whitehall. Whitehall is the skippy whipping boy of governments that are in trouble, just like Brussels is the whipping boy of councils of ministers who want to find an excuse for something that they have done in the privacy of a council of ministers. So let us understand that this is built on democracy by individual nation states sharing their sovereignty for the greater ability of their individual self-interest. And my next point, and I come back to Mr. Hannon, who began by saying, yeah, this is a two-tier debate, hearts and minds. The minds is all about the economics. And I thought, and perhaps I didn't do him justice, I thought that when we got to the hearts, he'd tell the truth. Because, let's be quite clear, the world, the advanced world, has had a pretty rough time over the last best part of a decade. And in the resentment and the bitterness of those harsh conditions, there has come a global phenomenon. Donald Trump. <laughs> no, 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 don't laugh, don't laugh. Mary Le Pen, Grio in Italy. There's one in Holland, there's one in Germany, and you know what's coming. There's one here, Nigel Farage. That is the real world. They talk of immigration, but it's really about race. That is the underlying agenda. And I want to come back to Michael's passionate plea about sovereign control of immigration. He is right. 184,000 people 
in net immigration terms, came to this country last year from the European Union, and Michael is right, we couldn't do anything to stop it under the agreements of free movement within Europe. 188,000 came from the rest of the world, over which we have total control. Total control. So why didn't we stop them? Why not? Immigration is the great threat, swamping our country, you know all the language. So why didn't we stop the 188,000, the majority, from outside? Well, you all know the reasons. First of all, we've got an ageing population and someone's got to look after them. Secondly, we're desperately short of skills and someone's got to fill those jobs. The whole of the social provision of this country is now underpinned by migrants from different parts of the world. And so the reason why we didn't stop the people over whom we had total control is because we need them here. That's the underlying problem of immigration. And And I have, I have just one last point, and forgive me if I, I say something that probably no one else, Mr. President, here tonight can say. I know something about sovereignty. I know what it's like to be alone. I was there in 1940. We were desperate for the Americans to come. The convoys across the Atlantic were being sunk. Our allies and armed forces in North Africa were dependent upon our ability to keep the supply lines of the Mediterranean open. I was there. The man in the desert is sovereign. He is free. He can do whatever he likes. But he has no power. And power is the essence of the political purpose. Unless you can do something, Unless you're in a position to take decisions and implement them, then you are powerless, however sovereign you may be. And in the shrinking world, the shrinking world in which this audience will play, I hope, an increasing part, you have to adjust the human organization to the scale of the challenge. And 60 million of us, with a massive 500 million cohort to our east are better together in finding the production lines, the shared research and development, better together in facing the massive public sector budgets of the Defense Department of America, the space budgets, the public sector support of every Asian country for their industrial development. We're better together doing that. And we have done it in peace. Every member of the European Union has to be a democracy. And in those 70 years, we've got rid of the fascists from Spain and Portugal. We've got rid of the colonels from Greece. We've just turned back the tide of communism in Italy and in France. And we have lived in peace. Of course, we share it with the Americans. We don't mind sharing sovereignty with the Americans. It's a bit of a problem trying to do it with some of our European allies. And what I want, Mr. President, is for this government of today, the parties of today, is to leave to the generation represented in this remarkable university the corridors of power, wherever they may be, the seats of influence, a place at the table, so that the self-interest of this country, driven by people like you, is as important in the generations to come as it has been in the generations of which I have been privileged to be a part.